Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm Kai Fajia, a PhD student from the Hong Kong Polytechnic University. Um, it's my pleasure to be here to introduce our work, demisting. Okay, sorry, demisting. Okay, okay. Uh, demystifying the price policy of third-party libraries in mobile apps. Okay, third-party libraries has been a fixed part of mobile apps to provide apps with advertisements, online social media, and single sign-on services, and etc. However, they still have questionable price policies, price issues, such as how they access users' behavior and how they clearly disclose them to users. Thus, legal document, legal departments have enacted laws to require such uh, cyber products to, inf to provide a document such as price policy to inform users of the data access behavior. However, price policies are mainly written in professional words and this makes it hard for users to read and understand the contents inside. Luckily, existing work has been proposed methods to help users understanding the price policies, such as have the <coughs> did, did those products uh, are Data access behavior are consistent with their claim claimants in their price policies. However, existing work mainly concentrated on the analysis of apps, but ignore those of third-party libraries. Exactly, regulations such as GDPR and CCPA regard the regard any parties who, who are responsible for the data access behavior to clearly disclose those data access behavior to users. Thus, we propose ATP Checker, an automatic third-party library privacy compliance tool to analyze the compliance inside. First, the tool collects the third-party library's price policy and the binary files from Marvel repository and the upgrade. And then, uh, ATP Checker analyzes the statements in price policies to extract the abstracted data usage patterns from the price policies, and then analyze the data usage data flow from the binary files. Then ATP Checker analyzes the consistency between the data flow and the statements in the price policy to identify whether they comply with the regulation requirements. And for the host apps, we mainly concentrate on the supply library usage and data sharing behavior of host apps in the host apps. Exactly, we also analyze the host apps price policy and the data flow. And then we, we identify the consistency the consistency between the data flow and their price policy compliance uh, statements. First of all, we construct a data set to, to build such a tool. First, we collect the TPR supply libraries from Brain, which is the statistic website which provides uh, three types of supply libraries inside. And from the upbringing, we can collect the supply library's name and their website. And finally, we can find their price policies in the website provided. Otherwise, we can not collect their price policies. For the supply library's binary files, based on the supply library's name provided on upbringing, we can collect them from the MAMO repository. And uh, however, we can only access the latest uh, binary files from the MAMO repository. For the host apps, we can access the top 10 apps that use the third-party libraries in the brain, and then we can access the, the, the host apps binary files and their price policies provided in, in Google Play. And next, based on the work constructed dataset, we use HP Checker to analyze third-party libraries binary files. We conduct a statistic, static analysis on the interested data. We use inter-procedure analysis and inter-procedure analysis to analyze, to analyze the interested data to identify whether the third-party libraries use the data. And then we use ATP Checker to analyze the third libraries parts policies. First, it process the parts policies to convert the HTML file to plain test. Then we analyze each statement inside to locate those settings that claim the data sharing and collection related settings inside. Then we use syntax parsing tree, which is a pattern-based natural language processing method to analyze the data entity and the data actor of the access behavior to identify the data usage uh, statements in the parse policy. And next, for the host apps, we, many, uh, we also considered on the third-party related usage inside. We first construct the function core graph of the app, and then we locate the statements that are related to processing information related variables. And then we conduct the interprocedure and interprocessor analysis across the function core graph to, look, to, trace the, to trace the variable usage in the data flow. And then we identify whether the third party library's package name is in the traces and to determine whether the host app share the data with the third party libraries. 
also for the price process, we also pre-process the price process first to, com to convert the HTML file to the plain test. And then we locate the data sharing related sentences, and also we use the syntax by string to analyze the data entities of the, of the sharing, sharing action. And then we we'll recognize whether the personal information is shared with the third party libraries in the sentences. To evaluate the ATP checker, we we'll first analyze the non optimal of the ATP checker, which means does the third party library provide such a privacy policy correctly? We we'll identify that over 31% of third party libraries do not provide such a privacy policy to clearly disclose their data access behavior with, uh, the, with the users. And we find that most of them are development tools because we found that most of those third party libraries are provided in public code repositories such as GitHub. Those, those third party libraries are mainly developed by a small group of developers, which means they may ignore such to provide such documents. Another interesting phenomenon is that we find some uh, popular companies such as Google and Apache provide many valuable third party libraries to have users build their apps. However, they just provide one general privacy policy, which means this, those privacy policies may overclaim their, their deluxe behavior for a specific third party libraries. And next, we, identify, we use ATP checker to identify the legality analysis of third party libraries, which, which means that the third party libraries' data access behavior are clearly disclosed in their privacy policies. We find that 30, 38 certified libraries access users' information in their binary files, but 18 of them doesn't clearly disclose those usage in their price policies. And that's the way we evaluate the ATP checker's performance on, on analyzing host apps. <coughs> and we identify that over 71% of host apps shares personal information with uh, certified libraries, and most of those traces are related to advertising ID and location. And finally, we analyzed the host app's private policy related to those certified library usages. We found that over 13, over 16 five apps do not comply with regulation requirements for clearly disclose their usage, certified library usage and their sharing behavior with certified usage. Most of them just, per, just claim in their private policy that they use some certain certified libraries and provide a link to the private policy to the certified libraries, but without clearly disclosing what kind of data they are sharing with the certified libraries. Uh, even ATP checker is designed for <coughs> identifying some privacy issues of third party libraries. There are some there are some limitations. And ATP checker cannot uh, uh, guarantee the consistency between the binary files and the privacy policies. Host apps or third party libraries updates every day. However, we cannot guarantee the privacy policy is updated accordingly. It cannot can only identify the consistency between the data input to the system, but it cannot add Guaranteeing the the version is consistent. Besides, ATP checker applies keyword matching pro, keyword matching methods in the parse policy analysis and the whole, and the host app state uh, and, and the data flow analysis. And uh, this may uh, this methods are vulnerable to obfuscation. And besides, this may cause uh, over matching. In future work, we plan to extend the ATP checker with uh, specific t TPR identification methods, such as using some uh, pattern recognition methods with sub function core graph. Besides, for price policy analysis, it's exactly a natural language processing problem. Uh, using pre trained large language model will be a promising uh, direction with the uh, big success of ChatGPT. Right. Okay, uh, that's all for our introduction. Uh, thanks for listening. We'll continue on anyway. No, but then when at the beginning you say that one of the inputs uh, on the this one. here. Yeah. You say the regulation requirement. Yes. Uh, how do you formalize or how do you model that? Oh, we just uh, read through the regulations such as CP and GDPR, uh, which are related to third party yeah, libraries. GDPR is, you know, a text written in English. Yes. Uh, how do you exploit the text in English into your system? 
I will just uh, summarize them, and we only uh, you have to concentrate on whether the the data usage and the data flow are clearly are clearly disclosed in their price policy, and we just up, uh, abstract the requirement to those one rule. Yes. Hi. Um, inter interesting talk. Uh, it's connected with your question. How um, have you <clears throat> have you looked at the effect of Apple's change of policy, where they actually, at least in Europe, they now query you as to whether you want any of your information shared, which has made many Apple users much more aware of the sharing that was going on in the background with their AP, uh, APIs. Um, do you know, um, you could do a comparison of, of the Android to Apple uh, situation, for example? Uh, exactly. We, uh, exactly uh, our work mainly concentrated on Android, and we find that uh, uh, Apple's though uh, have most strictly uh, requirements for developers to provide such a policy. So we, we haven't compared them exactly. Uh, thank you for your question. Yes, one. I just have a follow-up question from Luciano's uh, comment. Okay. So it is very difficult to know what regulation in a given context, depending upon the country or the region you are in, or your business yeah. case, there might be different regulations that might apply to you. And then within these regulations, there might yes. be some clauses that might or might not apply to you. Oh, yes. So how do you know? So who gives you this information? Or, and how do you encode that information in your tool chain? Uh, yes, uh, uh, yes, thank you for your question. And exactly, we, we only, uh, we just abstracted the problem into a very simple situation. I just uh, uh, did the, uh, do their action are, are, their, are their action consistent with their uh, claims in their price policy? And we um, we don't concentrate on. We also find that many many very writing price policies uh, specify that in different regions, such as European or American, are di with different requirements. Uh, exactly, we uh, we treat them uh, equally, and we do not uh, specific uh, different regions requirements. And uh, thank you for your question. Yes, thank you. Thank you for listening. Hello, everyone. I'm Zhiyuan Chang from Institute of Software Chinese Academy of Science. Today, I will introduce our paper, Cross-Domain Requirements Linking Through Adversarial-Based Domain Adaptation. Requirements Link is the process of associating requirements at different levels. It is applied in many software activities and is, and is the classic requirements engineering task and has been studied for many years. However, these studies will lose effectiveness for linking requirements link on cold start projects. Specifically, some small scale or newly start projects uh, generally contain few requirements and the link artifacts as data resources. On the other hand, even for projects with sufficient data resources, the requirements link are often missing or unreliable. So in this paper, we focus on building the promising requirements linking model for the cold start projects. Next, I will detail the shortcomings of previous research on cold start projects. The information retrieval based approaches first map the document test into the vector representation and then generate candidate links used using the similarity measures. However, this method based depend on keyword matching and term dismatches are often present in the software act artifacts which suffer from low accuracy. As for learning-based projects, which learn the semantic information of the test and the matching pattern of the linking through a large number of training samples. However, these approaches are supervised learning, which require label requirements links as prerequisite, which will lose effectiveness for co-star project. Besides, if the model trained with sufficient label samples in other data set, the distribution of features between different data sets is uneven, which results in poor performance. To address the both problem in computer vision domain, they propose domain ad uh, adaptation technique, which map the data from different domains into the same feature space. As shown on right, the da after data distribu uh, domain, distribu domain adaptation, the distribution in two domains are even, and the 
model trained in other domain could be applied to the target domain. However, there are challenges for domain adaptation. The first is how to learn domain environment features. Domain environment features are characteristics or patterns that can be generalized across different domains. However, the domain specific features are unique features within the domain that are difficult to adapt to other domains and typically have negative impacts on domain adaptation. So, it is challenging to design strategies to encourage models to prioritize domain environment features in cross-domain requirements linking. The second challenge is how to improve the transferability of features between domains. Recently, aerosario-based approaches have been successfully brought into domain adaptation, which minimizes the feature difference between source and target domains by training an adversarial discriminator. However, this approach lacks the perception of distance between domains, so feature transferability sharply decreases with increasing domain distance. So it is challenging to comprehensively utilize adversarial-based approaches and distance measurement to boost cross-domain requirements linking performance. To address the above challenges, we propose a cross-domain requirements linking via adversarial-based domain adaptation, named Red Asian, to adapt the linking model trade in the source domain to the target domain. Well, this part of phase three is the basic framework of adversarial-based learning. We train the adaptive target bird against domain discriminator by changing the domain labels. And phase one aims to mask the domain-specific features for better learning domain environment features, which correspond to the first challenge. And this part of phase three aims to introduce the distance measurement component to the, uh, to the adversarial based framework for minimize the distance between two domains for, uh, for better improving the transferability of features, which correspond to, to the second challenge. Specifically, phase one aims to mask domain specific features to guide the model to learn more domain environment features for better domain adaptation. Given the requirement and the artifact, Red Asian first applies standard data preprocess pipeline to obtain the token sequence. Then it applies domain specific feature masking. We use IDF based method to identify the sp domain specific features. IDF is a popular use measurement for words that could reflect a variety of words in a document set. If one word is common in, dom in one domain but rare in another, we are consider it as domain specific features. Specifically, we use step one, two, three to identify domain specific features and then replace it with mask flag in the feature sequence. Step two aims to build and train a requirements linking model in the source domain using label samples. The li linking, requirement linking model consists of two layer, the representation layer and the classification layer. Specifically, the model input is the masking feature and the corresponding li linking label from the source domain. After model is trained, the this phase outputs the trained representation layer and classification layer for predicting linking labels of the source domain samples. And phase three aims to adapt feature from target domain to source domain. This phase consists of two steps. The first is domain discriminator training. We train a domain discriminator to identify the domain of input samples. We label source masking feature with source domain labels and target masking feature with target domain labels. After supervised learning, the domain discriminator could accurately determine which domain the masking feature comes from. Second, we employ distance enhanced representative adaptation, which narrow the gap between hidden representations from source domain and target domain. For the input target masking feature, the corresponding label is set same as same of source domain, which is an opposing from the target domain. Based on the above design, Radiation trained adaptive target bird to encode the target sample into the representation space of source domain. Furthermore, it designed a distance measurement component which could minimize the distance between two domains for better guiding domain environment feature transfer. Phase four aims to predict requirements link on the target domain. Radiation used the adaptive target bird for encoding the target sample and the linking model training the source domain for predicting the linking information for target domain. And here is the detail of the data set. We use five commonly used data set in different domains and to demonstrate the discrepancy uh, 
to demonstrate discrepancy in data distribution of the data, of the data set, we ratio the result of the data distribution with testing tools. And we set four RQs to verify the validity of the method. RQ1 is to investigate the effectiveness of the radiation. We compare it with state-of-art baselines in terms of cross-domain requirements linking. The result, the result show that radiation could achieve promising performance and compared to the baseline method, radiation improves 13% to 43% F1. And RQ2 is, is to investigate whether each component could significantly improve the performance. We conduct ablation experiments by removing domain-specific feature masking component, this an enhanced loss component or both. The results show that removing DFM leads to 2% to 8% decrease in F1, showing the significance of masking domain-specific features. And performance decreased by 2% F1 on average after removing DL, indicating effectiveness of distant enhanced loss in guiding representation adaptation. RQ3 is to investigate whether performance will decline if we decrease the number of target samples. The results show that when using 25% target sample result in poor performance. However, there is a significant improvement when using 55% target samples. Furthermore, when using 75 target samples yields a performance similar to 100% of samples. So it implies that when the target sample of co-star projects are not especially abundant, radiation can also achieve promising results by appropriately reducing the number of target samples. RQ4 is to investigate whether radiation is sensitive to diversity of source domain. We divide the ex experimental setting in into three categories, the single domain, multi-domain, or 25% of multi-domain, which, is to, which is, is to ensure the number of samples in multi-domain is equivalent to single domain. The results show that the F1 improvement is 3% when comparing single domain to multi-domain, and as for comparing single domain to 25% of multi-domain, the precision slightly decreased, but records significantly improved by 6%. So the result imply that if the stakeholder can only collect a limited number of source samples, increasing the diversity of source domain could improve the performance of radiation. For conclusions, this study presents a novel approach to construct requirements links for co-star projects, which is the first time to introduce the adversarial-based domain adaptation approach for the cross-domain requirements ta linking task. And we propose two components win within the framework of the adversarial domain adaptation approach, which significantly boost the efficiency of cross-domain requirements linking. For evaluation, our approach could outperform the state-of-art approaches for cross-domain requirements linking and the general domain adaptation approach. Finally, we provide the public reproduction package, including the tool implementation and data set for future research endeavors. And here is the full performance to our paper. Thank you. Hello, hello. Uh, you mentioned the components in uh, RQ2, RQ3. So what's the component in this case? Could you please provide an like, example of the components? Sorry. Sorry, uh, you mentioned the, your components yeah. in uh, RQ2, RQ3. Um, could you please provide an like, uh, example of the components? Is it the components of the code or uh, the module? Something like that? Oh, I think the core of our approach is the adversarial based approach, and the, these two components is to enhance the uh, performance. And the, for the first component is, the, is to masking domain specific features, which is to, uh, in, for better learning domain environment feature. And the second component is, uh, uh, the second component is the, uh, to introduce distance measurement into the framework of the adversarial based uh, um, framework, which can also improve the performance. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so what kind of requirements links 
Are you oh, I requirements the natural language to natural language. Uh, I mean, what are the links? Is the, do they show similarity or dependencies? What are these links? What? Um, the links from requirements to standards or requirements to task cases. Okay, oh. okay. Um, and also, one of your, the evaluation study, one of them is much larger as compared to others. Did you see any impact of that? So HIPAA has around 1,900 requirements and the all other together are like 300 requirements or so. So I assume in, your, in your, one of your slides you show the number of requirements, right? Yes. This one? Yep. Ah. So the first one has 1,900 requirements and everything else has 10, yeah, 300-ish requirements. So do you see that's, I assume the first one, medical regulations, is like one domain? Well, um, although the number of the first uh, data set is uh, huge than the other, but we uh, sh want to, uh, but the distance between the domains are different and we visualize we, with the testing tools. So uh, I think it don't bother to the result. Given that you mentioned that you are interested in cross-domain uh, and linking cross-domain requirements, uh, can you give me an example of what a cross-domain requirement is in your work? Yeah, um, as for co-star uh, co project, um, typically they have few requirements link. So I have to train the uh, linking model in the other domain and uh, uh, use the linking model to the target domain. That is the cross domain. For the, and the uh, target domain is, is the co-star projects. Yeah, but specifically or in a concrete way. Concrete. What is required? Um, I'm, I'm sorry, could you... So can, can you give me an example of a requirement in your system? Um, <laughs> Maybe next time. That's okay. Hello, everybody. Uh, I'm Asha Rajboj. Uh, I'll present our paper on Dr. Model. Uh, Dr. Model automates the authoring of uh, models from diverse requirement specification documents. In this presentation, I'll cover motivation of taking up this work, high-level approach, validation result, and lesson learned. Yeah, about motivation, uh, I belong to industry, and uh, uh, in our industry, we observe that requirement engineering have remained document-centric and hence manual for many market-driven, complex, large-scale legacy business applications and products. This diverse form of documents are created and maintained by uh, his product teams. And this documentation typically runs into hundreds of pages. Requirement engineering ex engineer experts have to uh, sift through these documents and uh, for searching of the information, for analyzing of any new requirements. And this is time consuming and error prone activity. So uh, better information organization is needed uh, I belong to a model-based community, and hence uh, we thought of uh, digitalizing the requirement specification document into a model for the reason uh, model-based information organization enables automated querying, analysis, and also generation of SDLC artifacts. For automated model authoring uh, from diverse documents, uh, typically purpose-specific model extractors are implemented. Uh, and for these various skill expertise are needed like natural language processing, document technology, modeling, and so on. And developing a purpose-specific parser for each structural form involves huge effort. So to address these challenges, uh, we have created Doctor Model tool that provides mechanism for automated authoring of models from diversified documents. And the key contribution of uh, this paper are it provides uh, document structure agnostic and meta model agnostic uh, pattern mapping language to specify patterns. It provides a pattern interpreter to 
automate the authoring of models from natural language uh, text documents and it's architected such that it can be easily configured and extended for easy repurposing to a different context and it has been validated in the real world scenarios of three business products uh, before getting into the details of doctor model i'll quickly show the high level meta model we have used okay uh, we define a domain agnostic generic requirement specification meta model covering requirement specifications of typical business application uh, it covers concepts such as um, feature i'll just put a pointer here it covers concepts such as feature uh, processes then activities parameter rules and so on okay so features uh, hierarchy can be specified features are implemented by processes processes can have sub processes then processes can have activities sub activities and there can be a grouping of a parameters in param set and rules are grouped into rule set yeah now about document structure variability why is it important to consider document structures uh, it is observed that requirement specification documents are specified using rich text and styles uh, you and you know how uh, in word you can specify various styles and things like that and these various formatting such as heading level uh, section names rows and columns of tables text styles all collectively point to some meaningful information and this uh, figure shows uh, such four uh, document uh, snippets uh, here you can see the information in one of the requirement specification document was organized with a, a various heading structure sections are suitably named then within a section there were some uh, styles which were indicative of some information then another uh, document snippet here it had a similar uh, structure with some variation and they had also used a table for additional information this also uses a table form and another uh, snippet shows that only a uh, tabular form uh, of representation is uh, information organization was there uh, in fact and many times within a document this structured information also varies so it is important uh, to consider the document structure variability as well as a leveraging the document structure um doctor model leverages the style content information in document it consider the fact that related information is most of the time uh in most of the time it is specified with a structural containment okay and it leverages the structured and unstructured uh, information extraction the process of using doctor model is first uh, one has to understand how information is organized in documents and then understand the mapping of document content with the meta model and then encode the information extraction patterns uh for encoding the information extraction patterns we have a define a pattern mapping language okay uh, this language uh, specify various uh, types of syntaxes or statements like for value extraction there are heading statement style statement table statement then block statement to extract multi line uh, blocks of statement then sometimes we have to assign a default value uh, to some of the meta model entities so there are default value assignment statement meta model reference statement conditional statement and uh, control flow uh, statement i won't go into detail of the syntax uh, this is the high level architecture of doc2 model uh, you can see there is a pattern interpreter that takes the natural language document as input and a pattern as input this patterns uh, have a uh, property node um, and ages which specifies how each and every element in the pattern will be mapped with the document content um the pattern interpreter also provides the various uh, classifier function then text processing functions and for complex text, uh, text processing it's possible to plug in the external library which makes the entire architecture of doc2 model extensible a uh, pattern interpreter interprets this uh, it could be single pattern or multiple pattern it could be single document or multiple documents so pattern interpreter interprets these patterns over those documents and instantiates the model and once you have uh, information in the document in model form it can be queried for multiple purposes based on the input uh, text and the intent it can generate the sdlc artifact 
this is just an illustration of one sample uh, pattern just to tell you how one can encode this pattern on the um, right hand side you can see i have shown one uh, document snippet okay and here the uh, uh, feature hierarchy is indicated by the heading level 1 and heading level 2 uh, processes are described under uh, normal flow section, rules are described under business rule sections, and within then there are uh, bold underline which are indicative of the uh, sub-processes, activities, and um, rules, and then rule sets and rules and things like that, okay? And on the left-hand side, basically this is the pattern. This is a subset of the meta model that I have. And each of these uh, pattern elements, okay, then are specifying that how the information in the document can be instantiated into the model form. So here I have used this easy feature is the external function. Then there are classify functions that are used to classify the information that has been extracted from these various heading statements. Then there are some text processing functions used here. Then I've shown the go-to is the a uh, statement that can help navigating the uh, into um, any a place where you want to have uh, information extraction yeah uh, on the validation front uh, doctor model is validated uh, on three products uh, from different business domains so these are the three case study products that we have they are all from uh, different uh, domain and as I said this is for the large size complex uh, products okay so you can see these these are the uh, sample set of documents that were shared by each of these case study products okay and uh, using doc2 model we could digitalize all these uh, sample documents that have been provided into the model form uh, the case study covered uh, various scenarios like single document containing single structural form, single document containing multiple structural form, well-structured, not so well-structured documents. Then there, there is a mix of rich text forms like heading and style structured, a mix of heading and table structure. Um, using doc2 model large size models could be automatically authored um, and we have uh, validated it on the three dimension that is effectiveness efficiency and accuracy we got very good results uh, I, I think I'll, I'll skip this because of time yeah then uh, in conclusion I would like to say that doc2 model is found very effective in automated model authoring of large size uh, diverse requirement specification documents. Uh, it reduces the technological learning complexity and hence reduces the time and effort required for model authoring. Uh, the approach uh, is document structure and meta model agnostic and can be easily configured and extended uh, for repurposing to a different context. Um, on limitation front, I would like to say that uh, doc model is effective only if there is a good structural consistency in the documents. And if it is not, then probably either you have to pre-process document or you have to write multiple patterns for information extraction. Uh, another limitation is the identification of this pattern is manual. Uh, and there is also some syntax learning involved. So we are working on these uh, limitations. Uh, we, we are trying to minimize the human intervention uh, to the best possible way and we are also will be refining syntax further as we deploy this on multiple such products or domains okay uh, the validations is already uh, undergoing for different domains so uh, with this I'm concluding my presentation and thank you uh, I'll be happy to answer if you have any questions Okay, yes, please, behind you. Oh. Yeah, okay, so, uh, thanks for sharing very uh, interesting and challenging topics for all the random models from the requirements model, uh, requirements uh, uh, documentation and not the model. So uh, I think this, this topic is really uh, tough because when, uh, although we have the IEEE uh, SRS standards for 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 uh, helping people to write in the SRS, but for the different companies, different countries, they have their own style to write in the document, right? So uh, I just uh, go through your slides. 
you're using some kind of the uh, standard format to, uh, to as a basis, and then you extract some the uh, some the in, uh, inf informations from the uh, document to, to okay. form the model. But uh, this is really ideal situations. But in the real case, I think the mo most of the, the company they have don't have the same format. So how to deal with this is kind of a situation. Yes, yes, absolutely. Thanks for this question. Uh, in fact, uh, yeah. Uh, uh, thank you. And in fact, uh, I would say uh, uh, having same structure within the same organization, within the same product, is also not what is that we have seen. In fact, uh, let me take you to the, yeah, this slide. See, um, this, uh, we worked on three products. The case study was from the financial solutions and then one from uh, market infrastructure, another from the insurance domain, okay? All these three products shared as a sample documents. So within that single product also, there was not a single structure that was observed. Like there are these four, first four patterns are related with the case study one. The another four patterns are related with the case study two. Another four are related with the case study three. In fact, case study three was largely unstructured. So because it was largely unstructured, initially we had to do some document pre-processing so that um, with minimum number of uh, this uh, extraction patterns, we could extract the information. So the way to go about is, see whether you really want to create a new uh, document um, extraction patterns, or you can generalize to the extent possible, have the pattern, and wherever required, you can pre-process the documents. So that's the way uh, one would go when you want to um, have the extraction uh, of information. And this particular work has been carried out on to the existing product. So it was not a greenfield. So these were uh, very old products of going under the evolutionary maintenance of um, um, evolutionary maintenance and uh, maintenance uh, is for various new customer supports and that kind of thing. So there is already a large corpus of documents that is available. So the challenge is manually going through the document is challenge, right? And hence we have this tool which understands the structural variability and creates the model you can analyze. And once it is in the model form, we have, uh, it's not part of this paper, but the, my previous uh, paper in RE, we did talk about how do we extract dependency information from this model form. And then we have the complete traceability of various uh, artifacts that are available. Uh, in these documents. Okay, uh, do you ever think of... <laughs> okay, uh, uh, continue uh, uh, questions. Uh, do you ever uh, think about using some uh, like the large language models to help you to do the pre-process part? Uh, Yes. <laughs> yes. Uh, LLM is a very hot topic these days. Uh, everybody uh, wants to know about that. Uh, for pre-processing part, we haven't yet tried because this is more about the structured document where is rich text. At least uh, uh, to the best of my knowledge, GPT-3, neither GPT-4 understand uh, uh, rich text documents. Okay, it's largely plain text. But yes, we are exploring on the LLM and chat GPT. Thank you. Yeah. Good. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, on behalf of the collaborating, my name uh, is Zhijin from Peking University. <laughs> oh, microphone. Maybe you can use this. I can use this. Yeah. Uh, my name is Zhijin from Peking University, and uh, on behalf of the collaboration team, I would like to present here uh, our. Uh, requirements and Union Conference best research paper uh, here. Uh, the title is Environment Driven Abs uh, Abstraction Identification for Requirements Based uh, Testing. This is a showcase paper. And uh, yeah, uh, before, this before this work, we have done some uh, uh, a survey, an empirical study. Uh, this study shows the positive impact, impact of the environment uh, assumptions on the requirements-based testing. And despite the positive impact, this uh, survey also uh, report that the manual formulating 
a complete and correct environment assumption for scra from scratch is very difficult. So in, in this paper, we would like to do this, uh, to, to, to tell, tell, tell with this challenge. And uh, what is uh, the uh, environment assumption uh, uh, based on uh, Michael Jackson's uh, famous paper on the meaning of requirements and engineering is uh, show the uh, formula here. Uh, and uh, uh, this uh, an, uh, environment assumption is a statement about uh, the software system's uh, operational uh, context uh, when the software uh, uh, will be de deployed in this environment and the, uh, the developer will make sure this context will be true, uh, hold. And, uh, but, but many software uh, problems originally uh, in missing, uh, in inadequate and uh, inaccurate or changing uh, environment assumptions. So this uh, uh, environment assumption is very important for the success of the software development. And uh, we, our work is based on uh, requirements-based uh, testing framework proposed in 2010. And this work uh, is proposing uh, uh, this framework for handling the software quality assurance uh, by uh, two methods, by two steps. The first is to uh, validate uh, the requirements are uh, ambiguity, ambiguous, uh, com consistent, and uh, complete. And the second is to design a necessary and uh, uh, sufficient set of uh, test uh, cases from a, a black box per, per perspective to cover the validate, validated uh, requirements. So this is uh, the framework we are basing. So we propose to make two changes uh, to the requirement-based uh, testing. The first is uh, emphasizing the environment assumption. We believe that the set of uh, environment assumptions is, uh, is the in integral part of the high quality requirements. And uh, the second, we propose to shift from 100% requirement test coverage to find the box, uh, we, we learn from, uh, I mean, the, the digestion famous saying, testing shows the presence, not the absence of the box. So our vision here in this paper is to test the machine in such environment conditions that the requirements are not satisfied. Let's show in the uh, formula uh, in the bottom of the slides. So we how so we we will how to find the uh, such kind of uh, environment conditions uh, issue uh, in our re requirements based uh, test uh, process the environment assumptions should be uh, machine independent and uh, requirements related and uh, uh, directed uh, directed test table and uh, bug revealing. Uh, of course, automatically uh, generating complete uh, environment assumptions satisfying all the above uh, uh, desiderata is difficult, but less ambitious goal of discovering problem, uh, problem domain properties uh, from uh, natural language documents has been showed to be feasible in requirements and national domain. They are already many previous work has uh, shown this feasibility of uh, using uh, natural language processing uh, technique to deal with uh, requirements uh, documentation uh, to, to, to help these tasks. So, and uh, then uh, we, we, we propose such a, a tool chain to, do, to, to finish this task, uh, the first pre uh, pre-processing and uh, abstraction, uh, extract, extracting, and also relanking, uh, ranking the these assumptions. And after, after, I mean, after the paper has been published in a requirements engineering conference in 2021, we extended this paper to a journal version. which has been published in a requirements engineering journal in 2022. 
20 seconds. And also we developed the tool demo uh, uh, to show our idea to the unique tasks. And then I, I think uh, I, I want to show this tool demo to you to uh, let the, to, the, the demo to show how we deal with this uh, uh, difficult task to, for the abstraction identification. Yeah. And Hello, everyone. Um, I would like to um, do a quick two demo for the paper on the um, uh, CoLab 2 for abstraction identification. Uh, so the link of the tool is uh, provided in here. Uh, we also have a two demo paper published in the uh, Requirements Engineering Conference um, 2021. So the DOI is provided in here as well. Uh, so if you go to the link, uh, you'll be able to see the uh, Google Collab tool. All that you need to do is to follow the steps of the execution. Then you'll be able to um, use the tool to identify the abstractions from uh, the seeding and the related Wikipedia pages. So um, for the sake of today's demo, I'll not rerun these um, uh, installation steps. But what you need to do is to just click uh, this execution arrow here, and they will uh, load all these necessary natural language processing packages. And similarly, you will need to clear up the cache by um, doing the restart runtime here. And then the, <clears throat> the third step is to um, load, load up the spacey package so that uh, you could parsing the Wikipedia pages. So I'll just go into the bulk of the demo, which in this case is to manually provide a seed page. Uh, so for the first demo, I'll uh, try electronic health record. Uh, so you can copy the title of the page and then provide it as the seed page uh, value here. And then if you want more, you can change it to a different Number, so this number specifies how many wiki pages uh, you want the uh, corpus to be in order for the abstraction identification uh, to, uh, to happen. For this demo, I'm going to limit that to five. Uh, in the paper, we had a 250 that will take uh, more time. And then these are the different um, patterns uh, for abstraction identification as explained in the paper and uh, also in here. Uh, so the tool will also allow you to sort uh, different uh, results. So if I run this particular step for uh, identifying abstractions, and here are some of the results. So you can see that the usage of the pattern, um, for example, the first pattern of using part of speech has been used 58 times, and the last one consistently is the uh, most frequently used one is 212 times. And the results are shown here, so you can sort them um, through, for instance, alphabetically, and that will just uh, reorder them. So in the paper, we also have a uh, subject systems requirement so that you could uh, further extend the tool to match the abstractions uh, with the um, uh, the, the subject systems requirements, such as um, I trust. Uh, and other systems. Um, so the last bit, uh, so let me just uh, rerun this. So what this means is that for a key of record, there's a value EHR, electronic health um, records in here. And then for range, uh, there will be medical history, right? Uh, so if I deselect some of these patterns, uh, we will be only seeing how the last pattern is used. Um, it should still be 212 times, and then the some of the abstractions that are being identified through other patterns will not occur in the result set. So um, the last bit of the, uh, of the tool is to kind of trace back the original sentence or sentences in the wiki page where the abstraction occurs. So you can use that to uh, give you a better context to understand. So for instance, if you're interested in this particular um, abstraction with the key EHR and the value high risk, you can copy paste it in here I'm and then you'll be able to see the original sentence or sentences. In this case is one has the EHR sun, appear the in the beginning of the sentence here. and high risk somewhere so as, as a dependency relationship 
um, to be identified as the value. Uh, so I'll do one last quick demo to show you that you can change the domain um, by providing a different seed page, uh, which is web conferencing. And then I'll just still check the last pattern. Um, and then we'll, we'll be able to see that it's been used 99 times. And then here are some of the results. Yeah, that's it. Uh, if you have any questions, uh, let us know and try it out. And hopefully you can find this too uh, useful. Thank you. Yeah. yeah yes. Thank you. So we have now time for. Oh. It's, it's, it's okay. <laughs> it's okay. We are going to group the related uh, assumption and to build the uh, system assumption and then uh, do the, I mean, pro for producing the real time uh, required, uh, the test, test case or test the scenarios. So that's uh, our future work. And in fact, uh, in, my, in our AS, ASE paper, we have done this on a self-driving car to, to, to follow in this work. So that's, okay. that's all. Thank you. Thank you. We have time for one very quick question, if any. Okay, I will stand my representation. Hello, everyone. Good afternoon. My name is Zhang Yuxin, and I'm honored to introduce the web-based offline tool called StoryDraw Plus. It is specifically designed for mobile application developers, designers, and testers. This tool automatically extracts the storyboards from apps and provides rich visual representation and competitive analysis. Now, please join me in exploring the details of this tool. Nowadays, mobile apps are everywhere. We use various types of apps to accomplish daily tasks, such as reading, shopping, and chatting. As a result, companies and different organizations are working hard to develop new and practical apps, leading to increased competition among similar apps. However, there are still functional bugs and a lack of marketing competitiveness in mass, in mass mobile apps. Therefore, comprehensive review and competitive analysis of apps are crucial. However, so there is an urgent need for an automatic tool that can extract app storyboards and visualize them for effective analysis. To this end, Chen et al. proposed a hybrid method called Story Distiller, which combines static and dynamic methods to extract the, relative, the, relative, the relatively complete ATG and rich storyboards of apps more effectively. However, the lack of vision management also increases the difficulty for users to understand the storyboards. Therefore, to make full use of the value of those information, we have built a web-based offline tool named the StoryDroid Plus. To extract the complete APG and rich features of the app as comprehensively as possible, StoryDroid Story Plus integrates the exciting methods with reference to the uh, story distiller. As shown in this figure, Three phases are designed as following. First is decompiling and repackaging the input APK file, and then statically extracting the ATG and access date, and then uh, dynamically rendering your pages to explore the app. To better tell the app, we set up an offline web platform composed of user-friendly operation and a storyboard. We link the app information obtained by StoryDroid Plus in a written form to help users explore the app from a deep, from a deep level. The implementation of StoryDroid Plus on the offline web platform mainly includes five function modules. App exploration module supports both bunch or individual exploration on the website. And the storyboard display module shows the rendered UR pages together with ATG to show the app. 
Uh, competitive analysis models for the comparison of any two or more app functionalities based on the app storyboards and attri attribute searching model includes search for similar UI pages and components, which can inspire designers to design more competitive UIs. Well, app management modules post the management of the analyzed samples. To evaluate the effectiveness of StoryDraw Plus, we randomly selected 150 apps as test size and then compared with the three exciting ATG exploration tools, that is, IC3, Gator, and Stoat. The results show that StoryDraw Plus outperformed them in terms of transition, transition tires and activity coverage. Furthermore, the offline website of StoryJoy of StoryJoy Plus provides operation-friendly viral pages that vividly depict the storyboards of apps, which can help different stakeholders explore and understand apps from different perspectives. If you are interested in this tool, you can obtain more information from the following two links. And that's all. Thank you. Thank you very much. If you have any questions, you can ask me. Yeah, can you hear me? Yes, yes. OK. Uh, I do have a quick question. So given that you start from the APK, and then you derive the storyboard. Uh, how do you know that the storyboard is the right one? Uh, yes, because uh, we uh, we we said uh, we said experiments to uh, to uh, to uh, to make it to make it uh, first. Uh, 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 we, we are aiming to review and analyze uh, analyze the exciting uh, apps with similar purpose. Uh, so, uh, so our, our tool is mainly in divided into two parts. First, uh, first is aiming to uh, is from uh, comp complete ATG uh, of the apps and the tell the and then the second, the second part is to tell the app story. So, in the first one, uh, we compare all two uh, with three exciting advanced advanced ATJ exploration tool. Uh, the results show the star droid, uh, star droid class outperformed them in terms of transition transition pairs and activity coverage. Okay, thank you very much. Yes. <laughs> thank you very much. Bye bye. Okay, please. You have six minutes now. Oh, sorry, <laughs> no, sorry. You had eight, now Hello. you have seven. Hello, everyone. My name is Sean Long Chang. I come from Northeast Petroleum University in China. I present I your input gen a uh, tool. A tool for automatic. A tool for automatic. A tool for a tool for automatic generation of prototype inputs to support rapid requirements validation. Here is the motivation: rapid prototyping is an effective way for requirements validation. I'm to be to facilitate this process by rapidly. Uh, and uh, automatically generate prototype inputs, uh, prototype from requirements models to support requirements validation and uh, evolution. Here, here is an example of the requirements model. The system is a supermarket named Kokomi. It contains four parts. Here, here. Uh, we summarize the disadvantages of current tools. One is that the generator prototype requires stakeholders to manually enter input data that satisfies the pre- and post-conditions of system operations. And the other is that system stakeholders must spend time modding 
administrators and their oper operations for manually to add, add the initial data to the generator prototype. And this work is time consuming and laborious. So it's very desirable to have a approach and a case tool that can automatically generate prototype inputs to support the rapid requirements validation. So we developed the intelligent that uh, that is a tool that extends the functionality of M2PT. After using Imputagen, the enhanced prototype can automatically generate validated input data. Imputagen uh, has two features aiming at the disadvantages of the two M2PT mentioned above. Firstly, Imputagen Imputagen provides an external interface for loading initial data, which can save the time for the administrators. Initial data is imported from the YAML file, which can be viewed and modified easily by the user. Secondly, Imputagen automatically refactors and enhances the generator prototype from ARM2PT, which can generate validated input data of system operation for requirement. This is the uh, enhanced prototype. You can uh, click the load file button. You can click the load file button to easily import the initial data from the YAML file. And in this demo, you can click the button to randomly uh, generate uh, input data. And if you are not, not satisfied with it, you can also click the input box and uh, choose the other candidates. We, uh, we use four case studies to evaluate the input gen, and uh, table one is the complexity of the requirement models. And the, and uh, the evaluation result is sat satisfying that uh, on average, the enhanced prototype can improve requirements validation efficiency by 13.77 over the original generally generated prototype from ARM2PT. So uh, the conclusion is that uh, imposition is a more con effect uh, effective method for generating prototype inputs than manual inputting. And uh, the future work is to make our to the more effective and uh, for, for instance, uh, improve the current uh, algorithm to cover the more contract of system operations. And, uh, uh, and uh, that uh, integrates the larger uh, language models to automatically generate prototype input data, but in initial data, and uh, the more readable prototype inputs. And that's all, thank you. So questions? No questions. Okay. Uh, c can you go back to uh, the, the the results you have? So the, the evaluation. Oh, sorry. Oh. Okay. Uh, when you say that you are, uh, let's say, fourteen times faster. Can you give us an idea of the time needed? Because, you know, if it takes two seconds and you are 14 times faster, you know, in the end, it's, you know, it was 28, now it's two seconds. But if, you, if it was, you know, two days and now you are 14 times faster, uh, then, you know, it's a, it's a significant gain. Uh, uh, the civil time mostly... Uh uh, it's the same, same of the uh, modeling, the uh, administer, administer and their operations. It, uh, it's a very uh, time consuming and uh, laborious. And uh, 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 you can load the YAML file uh, from, uh, from, from a YAML file. Uh, this, is a man, uh, this is a time is uh, 4.13 hours. And yeah, sorry, yeah. I asked a question for which I had the answer on the slide. My, my, my bad, so sorry. Okay, thank you very much. 
Okay, hi, I'm uh, James. I'm from New Zealand, uh, the University of Auckland. Um, so uh, you've heard my paper title. So a little bit of background. So here we're interested in um, mining software requirements in online channels. Um, so previous work has shown that uh, online channels are, uh, uh, well, user feedback is a really good source of uh, requirements. And so in particular, online channels are really good for this as well. So this could be on platforms like app stores, Twitter, and forums. So our work is focused in particular on product forums. So when I say product forums, I mean a uh, online forum that's provided by the, um, the makers of the application to support their users. Um, so in our previous work, we had done some analysis on uh, the feedback in these forums, and we found that they contained a lot of information that was useful for uh, requirements engineers, including bug reports, feature requests, things we're familiar with. We also found that the replies um, contained useful information. So forums are generally threaded. And so these replies um, might contain some guidance. If uh, the initial poster is posting an issue they're having, then um, there can be some guidance around, you know, what the issue is, uh, what the user is experiencing. So when we came to do this work, we um, were interested in automatically classifying this requirement information. Um, one of the challenges here is because of a lot of information, it can be time consuming. So having classification tools can be very useful. One of the uh, kind of roadblocks we ran up against is that the information in forums can be quite um, ambiguous. You know, if a user is posting the issue, you don't always know if they're describing a bug report or if it's just a missing feature or maybe an unintuitive feature. So this led us to the idea that maybe we can use some of the replies, some of these guidance replies that are giving context uh, about the issue. Maybe we can leverage them to understand what the user is talking about. And also we were thinking about using um, existing documentation. So if you look at my uh, diagram here, if we're looking at the user forums, there might be relevant information in the issue tracker where they're documenting requirements they're working on and also um, in existing feature documentation. So coming into this work, the first thing we wanted to do was do a content analysis of particularly the replies and forums. So we looked at two large open source products, um, the VLC Media Player and Firefox Web Browser. And in the replies in both products, we found hundreds of links to um, the issue tracker. So these could be links saying, um, your issue actually is already known about, here's a link to the existing issue in the issue tracker. And um, we also found instances where they said, we didn't know about the issue that you're describing here. Here's a link to the issue tracker. Could you please enter it for us? The other thing um, that we saw, which I won't talk about too much today, is we found lots of links to um, frequently asked questions. And here they were supporting the users. So they were saying, you're having this issue. We actually have some documentation on this that might have a solution or workaround. Go here and uh, have a look. So here's a quick example. Um, this is from the VLC media player. So here, uh, one of the users describes a bug report. They're having some problems. And then another user comes in and says, you know, we already know about this issue you're having. Um, here's uh, a link to the issue tracker issue. Um, go and have a look at this. So this is um, the types of things we're finding. Um, and this is the data that we were using in our next step where we were trying to automate some of this matching behavior to try and support the developers who are doing this. So um, here's our process. I'm just going to give you some high level points here. Um, so uh, we had a, a set of forum documents describing user issues. And so we wanted to see if there were existing matches in the issue tracker. Um, so basically here we applied a deep learning model called USE, the universal sentence encoder. And for each forum document, we would do kind of a round robin similarity um, to see how semantically similar they were and see if they contained a similar requirement. So for each forum document, what we did is we took the top three documents, we evaluated them, and we found that we were, you know, with promising accuracy, able to find matching requirements between the user forum and the issue tracker. Okay, so uh, to finish up quickly, I think I'm almost at five minutes. Um, so some observations on our findings. Um, we saw that forums um, often do contain requirements that were previously unknown to the development team. We saw that these development teams we looked at were leveraging this feedback for requirements, you know, often transferring it to their issue tracker to work on. Um, however, this presumably takes a lot of their time and manual effort. So our automatic analysis tools, particularly matching 
uh, the forum issue to the issue tracker. Um, if there is no match found, potentially this means it's a new requirement and you know you could automatically transfer it to the issue tracker for development attention. If there is a match found, maybe you don't need to transfer it, but maybe you can consolidate details between them. So we see these automated techniques as potentially being useful for these developers. Great, that's uh, all I have, thank you. Yep, thank you very much. <laughs> and as usual, we have time for questions. Okay, let me uh, ask you a question. Given that you show, you, 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 you have two names there, VLC and Firefox. Yeah. Uh, is your analysis, your tool, your work, uh, assuming any predefined structure of the information you access, or can it be general or as general as one wants? Yeah, so the, the major thing we're doing is we're doing semantic similarity calculations between pairs of documents. So in the main example I showed is between um, a forum uh, issue and a uh, issue tracker entry. And so we use a deep learning model to do this, but we use that out of the box. So this kind of semantic similarity doesn't really have specific training. So, you know, in that way, it's quite generalizable. Okay. Thank you very much. Yeah. All right. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. I'm Niroshini. Oops. I don't know why that happened. It's AI enabled. Um, I'm Roshini, um, it's great to be here, um, and we also have one of our co-authors, Shethan, here as well, and his task today is to take nice photos of me. Um, all right, so um, today my talk is about, okay, thank you, human-centric, uh, our work in human-centric crowd computing. So first of all, what is crowd computing? So think of all the IoT devices in our pockets, in our living spaces, in our working environments, devices like uh, smartphones, uh, tablets, laptops, even robots. Um, so think of all, the, all these devices with a considerable amount of computational capacity and consider that these devices are continuing to grow in their computational ability. Um, I did not touch anything. <laughs> and um, they also continue to increase in number, right? So consider that if we can um, use this considerable number of, uh, considerable amount of computational resources um, in this pool of uh, end user devices, and if we can use that as a distributed uh, crowd-powered computing resource, how cool would that be, right? So this is the idea of crowd computing. So aspects of um, uh, crowd computing's technical uh, feasibility. Um, so there is a significant body of work in this area, particularly in uh, distributed computing. So these are things like um, task scheduling, task offloading, load balancing, or peer-to-peer -peer connectivity, and so on, and including my own PhD work. So there is a um, significant work in that area. However, there isn't much work in the human aspects. Uh, human, um, human as human-centric aspects, in particular human-centric requirements and uh, non-functional and functional requirements. So this is the gap we address in this work. So these are our key research questions that we investigate in our uh, research. So RQ1 is about um, the human-centric aspects and motivations for the adoption of crowd computing um, paradigm, right? And RQ2 is addressing or investiga investigating the um, functional and non-functional requirements uh, related to the designing of crowd computing apps. So in this, so RQ3 is about... Do you have the timer inside? No, no, I don't. I don't have time. Okay. Um, I'm sorry. I don't know why it keeps 
I'm not uh, It's touching. automatically changed to the, another slide. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, rogue AI, um, I don't know. Anyway, so RQ3 is um, how do we actually go about implementing the human-centric aspects from RQ1 and the uh, requirements from RQ2, right? Now, in this paper, we only focus on RQ1 and RQ2, and we leave RQ3 for uh, the next phase of work. Okay. All right, so how did we go about addressing um, RQ1 and RQ2? So we formed an interdisciplinary team uh, from researchers from IT and business. Uh, we used a model called Maya from crowdsourcing, uh, and we used that as a theoretical lens. So from that, we created a, a scenario-based online survey <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, in this survey, we had two imaginary cloud computing apps. Um, so it had to be imaginary or mock-up apps because we don't have uh, cloud computing apps in use at the moment. So in those apps, uh, those apps had um, five to six different scenarios. Those scenarios um, were mapped out to different incentives, right? So for example, we might ask, um, imagine you had to do this crowd computing task using this uh, um, crowd computing app. And if you did this task, like if you approved, if you uh, agreed to share your device to run this task, um, you might get paid. Or if you approve your device to run this task, you, are going, you will be helping someone, right? So different types of incentives. So um, for each scenario we asked, would you run this task on your device? How frequently would you run it? And what are your concerns and preferences? <clears throat> All right, so what did we find out from the data we collected? So we had um, 219 um, participants in the survey. And for RQ1, which is the um, human-centric aspect, so we found these three um, things tied to RQ1. Um, we found that if the user's goals are aligned with the app's goal. So for example, uh, I'm, interested in, um, I'm interested in making money. The app doesn't really have um, a particular social goal or anything, but it's pretty neutral. App's goal is neutral, and I'm just interested in earning money. So in that case, monetary incentives work well. But if the app has like an intrinsically social um, inside, um, um, goal, and I'm interested in helping people, but not necessarily uh, making money, in those scenarios, then monetary incentives are not the best ones. And in those scenarios, if the goals are aligned, then you don't actually need to offer money. So that is the user goal alignment. Uh, with autonomy, people said that they wanted the option to uh, be able to choose what kind of tasks they do and with whom they are sharing their device with. Um, with user engagement, people said um, they wanted to be able to interact with the cloud computing app and with other cloud computing users. Uh, for RQ2, which is about the uh, requirements, so from the data we, uh, we extracted these six requirements. So people wanted to be able to quickly identify um, relevant information about the task, like what does my device have to do and what do I get out of this? Like, if, do I get paid or what do I get? Uh, they wanted to be able to prioritize and filter um, their tasks based on their preferences or historical use. <laughs> 
um, they were concerned about the uh, battery drain and the data use uh, of their phone. Um, and also there were concerns about how much uh, disruption that task would cause to any task that the user would be running on their phones. Um, and also there, they mentioned that um, the app should have some kind of awareness about the context of the user and the context of the environment. And last, they also had concerns about um, not wasting resources. All right, so in the next phase of our work, we hope to implement a um, prototype app um, and run a human trial to evaluate our design. So effectively, we want to gather more data related to RQ1 and RQ2 um, to see if the findings with an actual human trial corroborate our findings here. And effectively, we also want to um, address RQ3, which is related to the actual implementation. All right, so that concludes my presentation. Um, any questions? last slide, but well, don't need to go back to it. So you mentioned that you want to develop a single uh, crowd computing high fidelity uh, application, something like that. But how can you embed everything in a single app? Yeah, good question. So um, at the moment we have um, we have API that So at the moment, we do have a kind of a prototypical uh, apps that let um, sharing of different kinds of tasks. But for the trial, we were only thinking about um, the human aspect. So we were not going to run a fully functional crowd computing app. So it would be like a it would be high fidelity in terms of the human aspects, like what the what the users would experience. But it's not going to be uh, an actual operational app. Yeah. Thank you very much.